um, in front of you. This is going to be the panel that you will see when you first get logged into NetRef. This is called the teacher panel. You'll see the word teacher up here. You'll see the classes you're assigned to here in the center as well as on the left side. The left side is your navigation. The middle is just going to be where you can do some personalization to the um, names of it. And I'll show you that at the end of our walkthrough. Down on the left-hand side, these are your reporting options. We're definitely gonna take a deep dive into those at the end of our walkthrough as well. I'm gonna go ahead and start a class. And to do that, you just click on this class from the left navigation bar here. If you're assigned to more than one school, you would see that school and then um, the classes you're assigned to listed um, in the drop down below it. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter English 201. You'll see the students populating as student tiles um, in the middle of your screen. Each student tile will have their name and then a dot that will signify what rule set they're currently in. If it's a green dot, that means all access to the internet is uh, available to them. You'll notice I have two friends here that are in the, um, we have a little lock icon. We're gonna talk about what rule set they're currently in, in a little bit. So over to the right-hand side, let's take a little um, guide through this environment. You have some icons. These are gonna be whole class actions that we'll talk about. And then down below, um, don't miss this little toggle. This is going to be changing the view of the student tile that you see in front of you. So if you toggle it over to tabs, you're just going to see a list of the tabs the student has open on their device. This is what will be defaulted when you first enter NetRef for the first time. So just note that you can change that view down on the right hand side of your screen. And then once you do set the view into the other option, it'll remember that the next time that you logged in. Okay, so couple of things. When you first enter your classroom, um, you're able to take actions with the specific students directly from their student tile. So let's take Clara here in the center. I'm going to just click on her tile, just a regular click, which is the left click. And we have four different options here. The first one is where she's at right now, which is allowing internet access for her, anything that's not blocked by the content filter she has access to. The one next to that, the X, that's going to block the internet for the student. So maybe Clara needs just to have a little more redirection. I have to give her some directions. I'll essentially stop the internet. So this is like your on and off switch for the internet. Give her those directions. And then when I'm ready, I can enable it again and she has access once again. Below that, you have the allow list. This is going to turn orange. So her dots in the allow list, you can see that there. This is going to have a list of sites I want Claire to focus on while blocking all other sites. So maybe it's one site, maybe it's five sites that I want Claire to be focused on, but I'm blocking access to all the rest of the internet. And then directly next to that, which will turn kind of a dark bluish color, that is your block list. That will be blocking sites from Clara. This will be maybe a site, maybe YouTube, for example, don't want her to have access, but I want her to have access to the rest of the internet. I can block that site from her using my block list. Well, how do we curate those lists? Let's take a look over here to our right hand side again. And we'll go quickly through these first four because they look familiar, I'm sure. You have allow internet for all students. So I'm going to go ahead and click that and you'll see hers has now cleared back to the green icon. This is a great practice when you first have your class enter your classroom and you turn that ref on or you go into your class is to just go over here and click on this green um, check. It essentially clears any rules the student has had from previous classes. So if um, the class in front of um, before you, the students were in the allow list mode and the teacher didn't clear it, you can clear it by just clicking this green check. Again, it's kind of a best practice when you first start your class for the day. Below that, you have block for all students, the allow list for all students, and then the block list for all students. To curate both of those lists, we go to this world icon. It brings up a dialog box that's going to be defaulted to start at the allow list. You see we have a general folder and we have a couple other folders listed here. I'll talk about that shortly. But in my general folder, I'm listing all the sites that I think my students need to interact with during my English 201 class on a daily basis. I want them to be considered my on-task, highly engaging sites. And the reason why 
Later, I'll show you how NetRef pulls information directly about these sites. So even if I don't set them in the allow list, it's still gonna pull information using these sites that I have listed here. So I do wanna list sites that I want my students to be interacting with to really know that they're engaged in the English 201 learning if I have those sites in mind. So these are obviously in a demonstration environment, but for example, I would have these three on here. YouTube being a very big one, I'll show you what we can do with that shortly. Um, but these are the sites that I consider highly engaging. To add a site to the list, you simply type in the URL or copy and paste up here. I'll do code.org for an example. The display name would be just something that if you want to organize, have organization, you can change the name or decide what to call it. Maybe um, it can be anything. And then hit the plus symbol and it's going to be added to the list. It'll be defaulted on, but you can always turn it off and you choose what you want to be part of your allow list when I enable that for my student. I just make sure I have what I want toggled on. I do have the option to create other folders to help me organize the different classes that I teach. So maybe I have English 201 here. I have specific sites for English 201. And then maybe I teach a math class as well. I would list specific sites on my math list. I can add this plus, um, with this plus symbol, I add a folder, double click on the folder to rename it. And what's really cool is you can, um, share the folder with a colleague. So you can pick another teacher that you maybe share the same classes um, or maybe the same subjects that you teach and you create a folder and they create a, a folder for a different class, share it with the teacher, give them an option if you want them to be able to edit. And once you share it, it shows up in their allow list um, dialog box. And then click save and it will be added here. To add URLs to the folder, you can do so manually or from your general list, if you have all the sites that you typically use on your general list, you can copy them over into those folders by clicking this little box next to it. And then you have the options to copy them into another folder or move them completely into another folder. This is also where you would delete these from your list, which I'm going to do to show you YouTube. So YouTube is a pretty, large site that can be really distracting for our students. However, as a teacher, I know that there's a lot of great educational value to YouTube, but to get them there and to keep them focused on that value um, can be a little troubling or tricky. So you can actually add specific URLs, excuse me, by copying and pasting them in. I'm gonna go ahead and delete these to show you. So now YouTube is no longer on my list. I'm going to copy that into here. This is that specific YouTube video. Let's call it math or equations or whatever. Hit the plus symbol. And now you can see the high level domain YouTube is going to be on the list, but the specific URL that I want them to view is going to be nestled under YouTube. It's going to be the one that's toggled on. So if I want all of YouTube, I would toggle it, but if I just want the one video, I can just toggle that one video on and that's what will show on their screen. Very helpful to keep that distraction um, away. The block list works very similar. In creating it, you would add the URL, a display name, you can add folders, share folders, all of those things. But remember a block list is going to be just blocking a site from the students while they still have access to the internet. So it could be something like YouTube or maybe your district has Instagram and you don't want it to be in your class. You can block that um, when you want to in your own classroom environment. I'm gonna head back to the allow list and just give you one more thing to think about. Even though you might have um, sites listed on your general folder and maybe you moved certain sites into the other folders, just note that all of these sites listed in every folder is part of the whole allow list group. So if I were to only want my students on Google News and I make sure everything's toggled off here, I do need to make sure it's all toggled off here and in my other folders as well. Anything that is toggled on, when I hit them in that allow list mode will be accessible, um, whether they you know, go to that site or not. So just note that these are all part of the same general 
big allow list. But again, it's going to pull that information for some really great reporting that I'll show you later. So those are the allow list block list. Again, you can get there for the individual student by just clicking a regular left click, or you can do that with your um, full class using these two icons here. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to the student tile and I'm gonna do a right click on a student. So I'll do player it again, and I'm gonna have a list of options that I can do with the student. The first being visiting the site. So with Clara, I see something she's doing that looks interesting or the, the student says, hey, you got to see what I found, but I'm working with another group of students. I can go ahead and visit the site and it will take me to the actual site the student is on. If it's super cool and beneficial, I can immediately add it to my allow list directly from Clara's tile, or I can add it to the block list if it's the opposite of what I want my students to be um, navigating to. Super easy one click feature there. I can also close the site. So um, I often did this when I would see kids on a site that they weren't supposed to. I can immediately close that site down and then their next tab uh, would open on their device. And then the next feature is a cool one where you can actually push that site out to other students in the class. So an example would be when I was a kid, it, we would find information in a book and we'd all have to gather around that one book and try to push our way to the front to see what the information was. This allows you to push the actual site out to all of the students' devices to take a look at that same information. I can push a site to the student. So I can put in a URL, a specific URL here, or these are going to be my allow list sites. So I have an option to have a one-click way to push out those sites to my students. That's going to open that site um, on their own devices. The next one is sending a message to the student. This is just a one-way message system, so me to student. Um, it will show up as a little uh, bubble in the bottom right-hand side of their screen, just letting them know that there is a message. I can also do a screen share. This would be sharing Clara's screen with the other students. So this would be like I'm sharing my screen to you now in Zoom. They would be able to share their screen and actually show what they're doing on that screen. So again, super helpful when they're doing a math problem and they need to show the steps or if they're highlighting information and they want to see what they're highlighting, you can do that by sharing the screen. You can also limit the tabs for the student. So for Clara, maybe she struggles with keeping too many tabs open, which I think some of us adults tend to do too, and it's hard to find things quickly. You can limit their tabs to, let's say four tabs. So Clara would be in that four tab mode. Again, she wouldn't be able to open more than four tabs. If I have her in a focus, this is helpful as well because I can just keep her on those four tabs. She wouldn't be able to access anything else, even though in a focus she isn't able to, but she wouldn't be able to open anything. Keep her in that mode. And then when I want her off of the tab um, restriction, I can do that by right clicking and the remove tab limit will be there and it will leave her screen. Excuse me. The other options are going to be for students on Windows devices. This is one of the differences between students on Chromebooks and students on Windows or Mac devices. If students are on Windows devices, you can log them out, restart them, or shut their devices down as well. You won't see these three options if your students are on a Chromebook. I think I have a student on a Chromebook. So here, like Colin, you just wouldn't see those options on the list. So those are all the actions you can do with the individual student. A lot of things to really help them stay focused with their learning. Over to the right again, we're gonna go down beyond the little globe. That's your allow list and block list for sites. We're gonna to go to the little waffle. It's going to be defaulted in green, which means all applications are allowed. So applications are going to be Windows devices or Mac devices. Students will have applications or different programs um, in their, on their devices already. Your tech department will curate this list. So anything that's on that device will be listed here. So you can see the different types of applications might be possible on your Windows device. And this is basically an allow list or a block list for applications. So for the allow list, I'm going to toggle on the applications I want the students to have access to, leaving the rest toggled off, which means they wouldn't have access to them. So for example, I maybe need a browser. So I chose Firefox as the browser. And PowerPoint is where they need to present their information. 
I think that might be all I have toggled on. And then when I use these buttons here on the right, the allow list is also orange for applications. It's going to turn the waffle orange to remind me that I'm in an allowed applications mode. Now the student, the students only have access to Firefox and PowerPoint. What's great about the allowed applications, it works really well with allowed lists for websites. So yes, I have Firefox as the browser. I can also narrow their focus in Firefox by using this allow list mode as well. So it really narrows their focus and keeps them distracting, um, the, the distracting things at bay. So I'm gonna go ahead and click back on the allowed application. When I want them to have access to all again, I would click this green check to turn the waffle green. And then to block applications, I go over to the block list with the toggle. And I have the example, I think of the calculator. So maybe they're taking a math exam and you don't want them to have access to the calculator. You might wanna do also the browsers because obviously they can um, look for calculators online as well. But once you do that and you put it in that blocked applications mode, it's going to turn the waffle that bluish color. They're going to be blocked from the applications you chose on the list. To block all applications, you would simply use this X here as well, and that would be the red, um, and it would block everything from the students. Just make sure you do go back to the green if you want their applications to be allowed once again, and that will show up here in the waffle to remind you. So those are the allow lists for sites allow list for applications. The plus icon are the other actions that you can take with class as a whole or groups of students. You can send messages. Again, this will be either for the whole class with that one checkbox, or you can do groups of students that are maybe working together and you need to give them some reminders. Open sites, pushing that site out, you do still have your allow list listed here as well. Again, for the whole class or groups. Screen share is now going to be sharing my screen with the students. Very helpful if you wanna show them how to navigate somewhere or do something with the real time view. You can do that again for groups or a whole class. And then limit tabs as well for any device. You can limit their tabs as a whole group as well. If students are on Windows or Mac devices, you can also log them out, restart their computers, or shut their computers down. Again, that might not be in your environment if your students are on Chromebooks. I'm gonna go ahead and close the actions. So that's a lot of different functionality that you can do within NetRef to really help you manage your environments. Now we're gonna take a look at history or the reporting options because we are not always able to catch everything the students are doing in live time. That's just not possible, but this allows you to have a little bit of uh, backup, meaning that you can go back in time and kind of see what students are doing um, during your class time or when things look suspicious, you can always go back and check. So the first place is within this classroom environment. You would click on the student tile, again, just a regular click, and you're gonna see this I in the center. So I is for information. When you click on that, you have a few things that you find here. The screenshot is going to show you a bigger version of the student's screen. History, we'll come back to in just a second. Screen share is going to again share my screen with the students. This is specific to one student versus the whole class or group of students. Permanent rules you may or may not see. This is just another layer of blocking sites that your district can decide to block from teachers or students. It usually happens within the content filter layer. That's like your main blocking um, of different sites and, and categories. Permanent rules is just another layer added if there's something that needs to come through the content filter but shouldn't be accessed by the rest of the um, people using the internet on, in the district, they can use that. So you may or may not see that. Info is just information about the student's device. History is what we would probably look at the most in this information tab. And history here is just going to be the list of sites that the student has, or the activity the student has done within the time period you select. So this is um, the date range. I'm gonna just leave it today, but you can change it to a generalized time period, or you can do more specific here with the calendar. You would hit the reload button if you do change that time. 
And you see here all the things that Clara has done during that time period. So what she's accessed, how long she's been on the site. It also shows you the actions me as the teacher has done with Clara. So you can see kind of what actions I've taken. And then over to the right, you'll see a little screenshot icon. If the student was on the site for a specific amount of time, it's going to take a screenshot originally. And then every 60 seconds, the student stays on that particular site. Um, mine's not gonna match the information, but let's say I needed to see where she was in Coursera. And then you just click on that. Obviously mine doesn't match, but every 60 seconds will show a different screenshot. And then you can download these to your local computer. These screenshots do stay in the system for only two weeks. Um, it's a lot of information for the system to hold. So it's a two week time period. All of the rest of the data stays in the system until your district decides to purge, which is typically the end of a school year or the beginning more likely the beginning of the next school year. But just note that if you do need a screenshot, you would need to, um, you would only access within two weeks. But it is really helpful to have the information when you need to have conversations with a student about their behavior, maybe teach parent teacher conferences, to have the ability to go back and see what the student um, has been doing while connected to the internet. This is all downloadable here as well as a CSV file. So that's great information to keep when you need it. So that's your first look at history or data. We'll go ahead and close that box. We're gonna take ourselves out of this, but before I do that, I want you to see, remember Dave and Emily have those little locks. This is a, a unique situation that would probably happen every once in a while in your district. It's called a timeout rule. It's um, set by administrators like your principals and guidance, or, um, vice principals, dean of students. This would be if a student is maybe in an in-school suspension or they're doing, um, they broke a technology policy, so they're kind of limited in their access to the internet for a time period. These rules follow them from class to class. So a teacher can't override this or um, change the rule in any way. That student is set in the rule until that lock is off or their timeout period is over. Again, if the students, if I set all the students in the block list here in my class and I don't turn that um, allow internet access on at the end of class, it's really no big deal. The students will move to the next class and whatever rule set that uh, next teacher puts them in will override whatever was before. Again, except for Dave and Emily who are in that um, specific timeout rule. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and do that. Make sure it's back to the green access. And we're going to head out. So we're going to do that using the class options button. This is your home key to take you back to the teacher panel. And we're going to go ahead and look into our reporting options. The first being the student report. Student report is student specific for the class that you choose here from your drop down. So again, this is going to be based on the classes you're assigned to. You choose the class from this drop down here. We'll do Clara again. You can change again the date to a, a specific date range or a more generalized date range. Hit the reload button to get the data to generate. The time online is going to be defaulted here to the total time online the student has um, accessed the internet for these particular days. So you can see how many minutes the student has actually been connected. These, um, there are two other options for this graph. You can do total block sites which will show you the amount of sites the student has tried to access that are blocked from them. I think that's helpful for um, some students to just really understand how often they're trying to um, interact with sites that we typically block. And then unique sites would be um, the number of sites the student has accessed um, as a whole. So if you do change this bar graph to either of these, you would have to hit that reload button again to generate the data. Now, Here's where your allow list comes into play, the time spent on allowed sites. It's going to take those allow list sites and consider them your on-task sites versus any other site on the internet as off-task. So that's why I said you really kind of want to put the sites that you want your students engaging with during class time on that allow list, even if you don't set them in an allow list, because it really does help you see how often they're on those specific sites versus anything else online. So in this case, Clara 
hasn't been on my on task sites very often. Now when I scroll down, I can actually see what sites she is accessing that are not on my allow list. All of these are downloadable in various forms, just by the three little lines here. Anything that's list form is downloadable as well as a CSV file. So this is a list of top 50 sites Clara has been accessing and the percentage of time she spent on those. So you can see even the top five, probably not on my allow list sites very often, even if it was YouTube, if it was a specific URL, chances are um, she's not just on that specific URL that I have on my allow list. Over here, the rule application is going to show me how often me as a teacher of History 301 has set the student in the um, block list, allow list, or blocked the internet. I haven't been doing it enough. Based on her top 50 sites, based on the on task versus off task, I definitely need to be setting her into a more focused session to really get her back on track. So this is really good information again to have, especially with parent teacher conferences and information that will help with um, anything to guide the student into making better choices. So that's student based. The next one is your class report. So it's based on your entire class. So you would choose your class from the drop down, change the date range, hit the reload button. Since this is a little bit more data, it could take a little bit longer to generate, it does for my demonstration environment for sure. So while that's going, I'll just explain the top two charts here. The total time online, again, is going to be based on all the time that the students in my class have spent online for that particular date range. You have the two other options as well, the total blocked and unique sites. This is your pie chart again, showing the amount of time the students have spent on the allowed list sites versus the not allowed list sites. Then I have my top 50 again. This is again based on the class. You can see YouTube the favorite in the class. And then the rule application. So in History 301, even for Clara versus the whole class, I really haven't used NetRef to its full ability. Definitely will be doing that, maybe just even blocking certain sites from the students from accessing. And then there's one other point here. And it's going to be the total time online based on the class average compared to um, all the students in the class. It's based on top 50 sites here. But if you do need a specific uh, site that you want to see how much time um, students have accessed based on the class average of that site, you can enter that here as well. It just defaults to having the list of 50 sites here listed for you. And it really is based on class average. So each student's compared to the average of the class. Anything within the standard deviation of one is in green. Obviously you see my Fowler friends are in red. They're way above the average of the class, spending a lot of time on, for example, YouTube, um, really changing the average of my students for sure. So this is definitely a way for me to address um, what kind of actions they're taking and maybe set them in some serious allow list or block list uh, rule sets. So that's your class reporting. Again, all of it is downloadable and stays in the system until your district purges. Engagement's very different. <clears throat> Engagement is going to be based per class. So you choose your class from the drop down, but then it's also going to be, um, uh, you have to set it with a tag filter. And I'll explain those. So every district for NetRef will have a paid tag filter and an engagement paid filter. So that means that they're going to, um, your district will put sites that you're paying for, the subscription sites into the paid category. That is very helpful for your district um, for their reporting options to kind of see the return on investment, to see how often um, you guys are really using the subscription sites. And then they also have the option to kind of put together a engagement group of um, sites, and that might be some that are paid, but also some that are free, but those sites that really help with the learning that's going on in your class. I'm going to use the example of for history that history.com is something that's part of that engagement tag. Um, it's in that category, and for my students to really understand history, they need to engage in history.com for a matter of 45 minutes a day to really understand um, history. 
the real um, use case scenario for me, the only example I have is that when I was a first grade teacher, my students needed to be on Lexia Learning or some students needed to be on Lexia Learning for 30 minutes a day, fully engaged. Um, and we had to keep track of that to kind of see so we knew that they were using it with fidelity. Our <laughs> program tracked their mouse movement to really let us know if they were truly engaged for that 30 minutes. That's what this also does for you. It'll show you whether they're truly engaged for that 45 minutes. Um, once you set your time and you hit reload, we'll see if this generates. Usually all my students are on track here. Yep, most of them. But it shows you the percentage of students that have met that 45 minimum um, per day for this time period that I set during history. You can see on this one day, it looks like maybe one student wasn't engaged fully and then today quite a few. This is um, based on the class. So I have about you know, 95% of my students have been engaged for that time period. So if you scroll down, it actually will show you which students um, either were absent for the day or if they were in class. So let's say Lyle was in class, but on this particular day, he was um, definitely not engaged. So he was definitely goofing around, not actively doing what he needed to do. This is really helpful when it was online learning for sure. It may be something that you decide to use in your class because there are times where you're not able to make sure that they're truly doing their job. This is just an option for you to use for that. And your district can set up more categories, by the way. Um, these are just examples, but they may often um, set up different categories for you to use this reporting. So those are your reporting options. I'm going to go back to class options here, which is our home. And now we're going to talk about how you can kind of personalize NetRef, change a few things to make it easier and more <sighs> aesthetically pleasing for you. A um, couple of things, information from your student information system, like the names of classes, are gonna be pulled over with the naming conventions that they have in that system. Oftentimes they are super confusing and not very um, user-friendly because they have to have very different, You know, maybe they're all numbers, maybe they just don't make any sense to us. Um, you can actually change them. So on the left side here, um, these are going to be the names of what's brought over from the system. So if I don't want it to be English 201, I can come over here to this little edit icon and I can actually change the name. So maybe I call it um, literature or lit class. As long as I keep it visible, it'll remain on this left navigation and I exclude it from the import. I don't need to check that because whatever, I, whatever changes I make in here won't be affected by the import and it won't affect the um, student information system. So once I click save, it'll be changed to lit class, something that I'm more familiar with. It'll also be there for me on the side. If I want to, I can hide them from the sidebar. Um, I was an elementary teacher, so I had AM and PM classes for the same group. Of course, I didn't want all of those listed. I can go to this little eye icon and actually hide those classes if there's multiples or duplicates or whatever the case may be. To get them back, you just simply unhide them. You can add a class. So I have a special group A here. I just went to add class. You just make the name, so let's make a group B. And then go to optional because you want it to be visible and you also want to exclude it from the import. So there's no um, changing of it. It's just going to stay in your system. You click next. And you choose the students from the roster on the right. So anybody that's rostered in the system for your, um, for your school will be listed. You just find the students, move them to the left, click save. And that group then will be part of your um, classes. So when I click into that group, it's just going to be the students that I chose. And then if there are times where you might need to merge classes or groups together, maybe you made two special project groups and now they're going to do something all together. You can do that by clicking the check boxes, merge appears, click merge, choose the class you want to be the primary, which will be the name of the class on the left, hit merge. And you can see now group B is nestled. Group A is the only thing over here. So when I click on that, it will be all the students from group A and group B. To unmerge them, you simply click on them. 
and click on merge. And then to delete a group, oops, go to the edit and you click delete. So you don't have to keep that group in there. So that's a way to personalize kind of your navigation and, and your classes. You also have the option to do a couple more preference choices. That's under your name dropdown, preferences. And this is another thing that teachers love is you can do some different things within your classroom environment. So you can just list the student first name on the tile or the last name. You can um, have the URL at the bottom of the tile or the tab title. You can have up to five activities on the tile. You can change the size. So if you have a much larger class and you need them a little smaller to see more of them or larger if you have a smaller class. And then just like inside the classroom environment, you could switch from screenshot to tabs. You can do that here as well, but you can also choose both, which will make the tile have both all of the tabs and the screenshot on the tile. You can sort them in the environment differently. I like to do mine by first name, but you can do it by last or both. A is D, D to A. And then this one's kind of a favorite because there's often times where you kind of want to just keep track of a couple students and maybe they're your more off task students, the kids that are navigating things that aren't on your allow list, you can do that by putting them up to the top of your list, or just the students online for the day. Maybe you just have a small group online, you want them at the top of the list as well. And then this bottom part is for your left hand display here. You can sort them by the name or the period of the class. And then your sidebar can be a little larger if you want that a little larger there. So that's your preferences. Now, the last place I want to take you is the support section, and that's going to be where your help documents are. Name drop down, click support. First thing I want you to take note of is the third user guide. This is where you're going to find all information that we talked about today, including reporting. So the report panel is something different. You want to stick with the teacher panel. This user guide is a super helpful um, screenshots, explanations of all the things we talked about today. Um, including those reporting options and what those engagement tags and all that means as well. Great first place to go. There's going to be short videos up here for you for different parts of NetRef. And then the frequently asked questions is another place to check out if you do have questions about NetRef. Again, this is a great first place to go when you're in the moment and you're in your class, but then of course your instructional coaches in the district, people that are there to support you is another great place to go as well.